Thank you. And good morning to you all. We are going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 11 uh, this morning. So if you've got a copy of the Old Testament, please do turn that up or read it with me. The screen behind, just a little word that the books that uh, some already have ordered doing what's right are available, and there's still time to uh, get yourself a copy of that book that is designed to help guide us through some of the huge ethical questions, what's right, what's wrong, and lots of different scenarios. So uh, again, I recommend that to you. I've been reading away at it this week, and uh, no doubt will be over the next few weeks because we are dealing with a lot of very big questions. So now let's come to our reading, 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 5. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And so begins what is a pivotal chapter in David's story. David is now in middle age at the height of his power. His enemies are subdued, his kingdom expanded. But from this point, his kingdom and his power appear to stall. The rapid expansion stops. And so the question is, why was that? And it would be useful, I think, to keep that question in mind as we go through this and the subsequent chapters. I hope you've been able to take up my encouragement to you to read the details of the chapters, especially 11 and 12 for this morning, and then 13 and following for next week. This story is powerfully told. It's brilliant writing apart from anything else. It's a story of self-indulgence, of the abuse of power. It is also a story of repentance and forgiveness. It's a story also of having then to live through the consequences of wrong choices. We're told at the start, the scene is set. It was early spring. The heavy winter rains were over. It was the time, we're told, when kings went out to deal with their enemies, to reestablish security for their people, to get soldiers on the move. And they could now move because the rains were over, so they didn't get bogged down or swept away by rivers in flood. But instead of leading, instead of going with his troops, David decided to take a break. We've been used to David trying to find people to be kind to, so I suppose we could say now it was time for David, he thought, to be kind to himself. So he sent Joab off with the army, and he stayed at home. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with delegation. Delegation is important. A leader can't do everything. But delegation becomes dangerous when it is an excuse for not leading. But perhaps he felt that with all he had now achieved, he deserved a rest, especially now that he's in middle age. I don't know if he had a little middle age spread going on, but uh, he was middle aged, he was well established, didn't need the disciplines, he thought, that he needed as a young man. He can do with all that out all that getting up early in the morning and marching around the country and motivating and guiding his men. The temptations of middle age. Easy for me to talk about because I'm on the other side of that now, but 
you know, if your career is going well, a bit more money around, life just not as tough as it used to be, tempting to ease up a little, to set aside, at least for a while, those early morning disciplines, to be kind to ourselves, to indulge ourselves a little. After all, we've worked hard. We deserve this. We're worth it. And the attitude can spill, of course, into our spiritual life as well. We used to be really keen in our late teens and early 20s, in the early years of marriage, keen and active, spiritual warriors, praying, studying the Bible, sharing our faith, Uh, in our studies, in our professional life, engaging frequently with other believers, serving in the ministries of the church. But gradually we eased off. We took our foot off the pedal and no longer seeking first God's kingdom, his rule and righteousness in our life. It's not that we're not doing anything. It's just things started to slide such a dangerous temptation because we so easily lose sight of the fact that serving these basic disciplines of the spiritual life are designed by God to protect us, to save our lives, to save us from filling them with other things. They keep us spiritually alert, spiritually hungry, humble, dependent on the Holy Spirit. They keep us in prayer. They keep us in God's Word, in spiritual communion with the Lord and with one another. They help protect us from the ongoing battering we receive in this world. Because our enemy doesn't play fair. He prowls around like a ravenous lion, Peter said, seeking prey to devour, and he knew something about that. Let's not make it easy for him through self-indulgent laziness. When it comes to spiritual life and spiritual, the spiritual battles of life, we can't delegate this to anyone else. Don't leave it to your spouse. Don't leave it to your kids. Don't leave it to the elders of the church. Don't leave it to the leaders in the youth ministry. Each of us needs to take responsibility for ourselves spiritually. And whatever progress we made in the past, the fact is that we still have our weaknesses, which can so easily be exploited if we're not alert and watching and praying and disciplined. Because David, a great man, but he had his weaknesses. Now, when he was younger, training to be king, chased by Saul, he probably was too focused on survival, on depending on God, on seeking to please him, to indulge those weaknesses very much. But they were there, and one of them was his impulsiveness, a tendency to place his feelings and passions above reason and wisdom. Another was the presence of a beautiful woman. You may remember the story how when he and his men had been badly treated by a rich but very mean landowner called Nabal, David flew into rage and was bent on putting Nabal and his servants to the sword. He was prevented by the courageous wisdom of Abigail. Nabal's beautiful wife. Taking her life in her hands, she rushed to intercept David. And in one of the great historical speeches, she reasoned with David, pointed him away from her husband's foolishness to the far bigger picture of the God's calling and purposes in David's life. She argued with David. She reasoned with him. She told him, God is going to make you king, David. And when that happens, you will be so relieved not to have on your conscience the heavy burden of having shed needless blood. David, on that occasion, listened. He stopped in his tracks. Was it because she was wise or because she was beautiful? Perhaps we'll never know. 
It's no surprise that when Nabal then died suddenly of heart failure, Abigail became David's next wife. Here, once again, we have David and a beautiful woman, but David is king now. Middle age, being kind to himself, leaving the fighting to others, the discipline of a soldier's life, a thing at least temporarily of the past. Now, I doubt very much whether he got up that day planning to commit adultery and then murder. It was unintentional, but taking it easy, indulging himself, the normal discipline's gone, his desires roused, and this time, There are no wise words to halt him in his tracks. He was king now. A servant simply did his bidding. He was the leader. No words of wisdom were spoken to him. He didn't even reason with himself, nor did he allow God's word on the matter, which he knew very well, to overrule his desires. He saw Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop, found out who she was, sent for her, lay with her. And then when sometime later Bathsheba sent word to him that she was pregnant, David, as you read the details of the story, twice attempted to manipulate Uriah into taking a break from his army duties and spend a night with his wife. And when those attempts failed, David abused his power further by issuing secret orders that in the heat of the battle, Uriah's little squad of men should be left exposed leading to their inevitable death. So by proxy, David shed innocent blood. The very thing that years before Abigail's wisdom had once saved him. Bathsheba, we read, mourned her husband, and when her time of mourning was up, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife, and she bore him a son. And all of this, is conveyed in a remarkably matter-of-fact way. There are no descriptive flourishes, no moralistic interventions by the author. There's no psychoanalysis going on, no literary tour de force, just the basic, I was going to say, boring facts. Because sin is basically repetitive, and it's boring. But then... In the last words of the chapter we read, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And so now the focus shifts from recording the thing that David had done and almost the feeling that he's going to get away with it to recording what God thought of what David had done. Because God sent the prophet Nathan to David to spell it out to him. And very wisely and cleverly, instead of confronting the king directly, Nathan told him a story, a parable, with no names, nothing that at first sight referred to David's personal circumstances. It was cleverly designed to get David to assess the issues involved, objectively, without personality, without personal feelings getting in the way. So the story was about a rich man with large flocks of animals and a poor man who had only one lamb, which he treated as if it were his daughter. And one day the rich man had a guest for dinner, but instead of taking an animal from his own plentiful herds as the main course, he took the poor man's lamb, something that didn't belong to him, and served it up to his guest. Well, when David heard the story, the objective facts, he had no difficulty recognizing the injustice involved. His God-given moral sense was working extremely well. The rich man was wrong. He deserved to die for what he had done. But at least as the law stipulated, he should be made to repay fourfold what he had taken. And Nathan now turned and said to him in one of the most famous scenes in the Old Testament, you are the man. David was the rich man in the story. He had abused his power and taken what wasn't his to take. First, 
Uriah's wife, and then Uriah's life. But by responding as he had done to the injustice in the parable, David condemned himself out of his own mouth. Too late now to resort to the modern morality is subjective. Right and wrong is culturally determined. So beloved in our modern world because it allows us to excuse what we know instinctively to be wrong. Morality is not subjective. It's not purely relative to individual culture. Whatever differences there are, and there are between cultures, as C.S. Lewis pointed out many years ago, there is a shared core of universal moral values. What culture do you know of thinks that taking what truly belongs to someone else is legitimate? Why do we have justice systems? Core morality is objective. The sexual abuse of children is not a matter of personal taste. It is wrong. The rape of women is wrong. Murder is wrong. The taking of a young woman's life as she went for a jog along a canal is wrong. And we all know these things are wrong. Is there anyone, really, who believes that morality is subjective? Even those moral philosophers who write about these things and argue that morality is subjective and relative they would be the first to protest if I came along and stole their ideas and published them as my own. Well, why shouldn't I if morality is subjective? Or even worse, if someone raped their spouse or murdered their child. This was wrong, what David did. It's wrong. According to Nathan's parable, the core of the sin was not simply that the rich man was mean and nasty. It was that he took something precious that was not his to take, something that was a precious part of this poor man's life. And David had done the same at a much higher level because he was king. Now, we have to be very careful how we express this idea in a contemporary world the idea of ownership, of, of belonging to someone else is so easily misunderstood. And there are many women especially who feel that they have been treated just like a piece of property. But that's not what is implied by the one flesh relationship of marriage where two become one yet remain two individuals who belong to each other. It is a positive thing. It provides protection, stability, and exclusive intimate context for the cherishing of one another. It's in that understanding of marriage that David had abused his power and taken what belonged to someone else. Bathsheba wasn't his to take, even as king or perhaps we should say especially as king. And in doing so, David had not only sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, he had sinned against God. And it's not just, please notice, it's not simply because adultery is wrong. It is because David, by doing what he did, completely misrepresented God and God's view of power and the use of power. Let me explain. The general concept of power in David's day and still today in certain parts of the world is that the person who's got the power can do what he wants, can take what he likes, can take whoever he wants whenever he wants, no matter to whom it belongs. Is that God's concept of power? Well, if you'd watched what David did, you'd have thought that because David was God's king, God's man, the man after God's own heart. Is this what God is like? 
Well, of course not. God's concept of power is that even if the king on the throne abuses his power, God will judge him. This is, this is amazing to me. God is the all-powerful creator. He owns everything, but he believes in ownership. He believes in giving. He believes in individuality. He gives us ourselves, our personality, our free will, the most precious part of what it means to be a human being. And he gives us, grants us the responsibility and freedom to decide what we will do with it. He will go out of his way to demonstrate that he loves us, but he will never abuse his power or his love by overruling your free will and take you without your consent. And if you decide to say no to God and persist in saying no, God will respect your choice for eternity. So God would deal with David. God has no favorites. He will not turn a blind eye to evil. David, like all of us, was flawed. Yes, it's true that he was a man after God's own heart. The Bible says that. But in some respect, he wasn't a man after God's own heart. And God was determined to make it clear to everyone precisely where David wasn't a man after his own heart. But there's something else here which, again, I find remarkable, amazing. How did David respond? Can you imagine confronting President Putin, perhaps? Or confronting some of the great dictators of the past or present with this kind of stuff? How would they take it if you told them that they had taken something that didn't belong to them? They would have laughed you out of court. They would simply do what Herod the Great did when John the Baptist confronted him about his evil. It's not right that you should have this woman. He just shut him up, put him in prison, ended up killing him. Dictators, all-powerful kings and emperors were not in the habit of publicly acknowledging sin and guilt, nor did they have the habit of repenting. But David immediately acknowledged and repented of his sin. This is amazing. What ancient monarch would have bowed low and confessed to having been a sinner and taking another man's wife? What ancient or modern dictator could write the words of Psalm 51, which David wrote in response to his sin? I know my transgression. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David agreed with God's verdict on him and acknowledged that he repented and he found forgiveness. Through Nathan, God told him that his sin was removed not that it was ignored or forgotten about or dismissed uh, as not being relevant, but removed. That is forgiven. David had fully acknowledged and repented of his sin. He was forgiven. Because as the New Testament constantly reminds us, there is no forgiveness without repentance. But as you come to this, we could be forgiven for wondering, how could God possibly forgive David, well, I have a bigger question for you. How could God possibly forgive you? And an even bigger one, how could he possibly forgive me? We are great at having a hierarchy of sins, aren't we? And judging everyone else. But inside our own heart, How can God possibly forgive me? And we've been singing about the answer this morning. I hope you noticed it. We've been singing about the cross of Christ. Because God will never say to us that sin doesn't matter. 
Because he'll never say to us that you don't matter. We matter. We are moral beings in a moral universe. Sin matters and has to be dealt with. God simply can't shut his eyes and say, well, let's just let bygones be guys. It's fine. It has to be dealt with. So how can a holy God deal with it and demonstrate his love and his desire for us to be with him? How can he possibly make that happen? Through a descendant of David, Messiah coming and laying his life down on the cross, bearing our sin in his own body on the cross. That's how it is. We all stand on the same ground here. God has no favorites. And forgiveness is open to all of us. Have you received it yet as God's gift to you? Or are you still busy trying to atone for your own sins? You'll never make it. It'll be a burden that will hold you down and you'll be a slave all your life. God offers his forgiveness freely to us. The cross of Christ, you see, works backwards as well as forwards in human history. It covers David's sin and mine. But Nathan hadn't finished. It's not the only thing he told him. While God has removed his sin, the penalty as I have expressed it, Nathan now told David that there were going to be serious consequences in his life as a result of what he had done and they would not be removed. The distinction between penalty, the penalty of our sin, and the consequences of our sin is extremely important and not always grasped. You can forgive a person, but you can't forgive consequences. There is forgiveness with God. That forgiveness is real and total. We are to celebrate it and enjoy it. The guilt and penalty are removed because what Christ has done for us, but there are also consequences, and they can't be forgiven. As Paul puts it, we reap what we sow. And using Paul's analogy, imagine a county antrim farmer is told one day by God to sow wheat in his field. But when he gets to the farm shop to buy his seed, he discovered that oats are in special offer. And so he decides, being a canny county antrim man, I get oats instead, so much better value. So he decides to sow oats instead. When sometime later God confronts him with his direct disobedience. The farmer, I hope, will confess and will repent and God forgives him. But does he then supernaturally change the oats into wheat? The farmer has to live with the consequences, not the penalty, but the consequences. If you get tempted into drug taking, damage your body, you get converted, you find God's forgiveness, you'll still have to live with the damage you've caused to your body by your drug taking. And if in order to feed your habit of drug taking, you steal from others and eventually get caught in murdering someone, yes, there is forgiveness with God, but you will have to live through the consequences. Nathan spelt these out to David, and they're not easy to read. They must have been hard to listen to. Spelling out the result of bringing into his life such an egregious breaking of God's ways, sexual immorality, violence, the abuse of power, all of that. 
The baby that was born would become ill and die. His family would be pulled apart by all kinds of immorality and violence. You can read the details for yourself. And we look at that and we, we go, I can't get my head around it. It seems too hard. It seems unfair. Now, let's just remember that the specific details are God's sovereign ways with King David, not with us. Let's be very careful about finding any kind of one-to-one -one equivalence with our own lives, with what, how God chose to deal with the king. But it's still difficult. There are mysteries here that I certainly can't fathom. But it is important sooner or later that we face up to the issues and work out how to cope with them because we meet this kind of thing in life. I have two sisters that I have never met because they died before I was born. How can I possibly understand that? Indeed, I need to be very careful not to misunderstand it. We could argue with God over almost every death as being unfair in some way. We can protest that this child or this friend or this spouse did not deserve to die, but it is not our call to make. We are not God. God is God. He is sovereign, and we all die. Moreover, we approach these things from a temporal point of view, where death is the ultimate disaster, but it isn't. It certainly wasn't for David. He mourned and wept before the child died, but when the child died, he dried his tears, he got up. And those around him were absolutely astonished, and he said, why? Well, he said, as long as the child was alive, there was a chance perhaps God would have had mercy. But he didn't. But this isn't the end. I will go one day and be with him. I'll see him again. The different dimensions we're dealing with here, that this world is not the only world there is. Of course, it is the only world, and there is no hope if we re remove God, but does that help? Let's suppose you read this story and said, I've had enough, I can't cope with this. There, there can't be a God. Well, how does that help? It removes all possibility of the hope that David talks about here. The whole thing becomes absurd. That doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that the Christian hope is true, but it doesn't mean it's false either. The question for you and me is not, are there things like this in life which we find very difficult and impossible to understand? Of course there are. The question rather is this, is there enough evidence to trust God, even though there are things that seem unfair to us and go way beyond our understanding. I believe there is. But let me finish with this. The complications and difficulties that came into David's life as a consequence of his sin were not designed to make him miserable. They were designed to bring him closer to the heart of God. God's purpose for your life, for my life, as Hebrews puts it, is to bring us as mature, grown-up adult children to be with him in glory. Not to live, leave us as infants. And that is a lifelong process, and many of us aren't good at waiting and accepting that growth and training take time and sometimes involve pain. We want to think that we're ready. Ask the David of 2 Samuel chapter 9, are you ready? And you look at the evidence of how he, he treated Mephibosheth and you think, absolutely, he's ready to go to be with the Lord right now. No, he wasn't. There's a whole lot of undealt with stuff in David's life. Genuine faith, but mixed in with that, all kinds of twists in his character and personality that needed to be faced 
and sorted out. God's forgiveness doesn't mean that God is ready to take us to be with him. He wants us to learn, for example, how ugly a thing sin is. Teach us to hate sin in our own lives, to learn to fight it, to keep fighting, to develop loyalty and Christ-like character. But underneath it all, God's forgiveness provides the solid platform on which we can stand and face the very worst about ourselves and cooperate with God. Not run away. Not give up but cooperate with God as he makes us ready for the world to come. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would use your word in our lives. This is a serious story. It raises all kinds of huge issues. But we thank you that at the heart of it is a God who forgives a holy God who calls us to himself and who has made it possible for us to have our sin removed through the cross of Christ. We thank you for that wonderful, wonderful centrality of the Christian message. It is not try hard, do better. It is rather that what we can't do, Christ has done. What we can't achieve, he has achieved. And the basis of our acceptance with you is not how we perform this week, but it is what Christ has achieved for us. We thank you. And may the strength of your forgiveness flow through our lives and enable us to face up to what we find within us and enable us to work with your spirit as he seeks to make us more like the Lord Jesus himself. We pray in his name. Amen.